evening. My name is Alex Kocha. These are my colleagues Megan Thomason and Theodora Hannon. On behalf of the Dean's Fellows for the College of Arts and Letters, we welcome you to the gay marriage debate. We are honored to have on campus John Pervino and Maggie Gallagher, our participants in tonight's debate. The presidential debates have been a topic of our national discussion for the last few weeks. We now turn to a component of that political discourse tonight. The topic of gay marriage is becoming increasingly visible as a key part of today's social issues, and there's plenty of contention regarding its status. Disagreement can often lead to heated language and rising tempers on both sides. So before we begin, we would like to address our desire for this engagement tonight. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to discuss this topic and to hear each other's opinions. It will take patience and wisdom, and I know that we can rise to the occasion. In the spirit of Notre Dame's pledge for virtuous discourse, and as members of the university dedicated to Our Lady, whose son said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, let us embrace the obligation to seek and speak truth. Let us pledge to practice, to the best of our ability, the following virtues when engaging in political, social, cultural, and religious dialogues. Let us especially commit to practicing these virtues in our exchanges with those whose views and values differ from our own. These virtues are honesty, knowledge, accountability, generosity, humility, courage, and judgment. So please keep these in mind throughout the, the, the debate and during the question and answer segment. This dialogue would not have been possible without the immense generosity of our sponsors. The Hankel Lecture Fund from the Institute for Scholarship in the Liberal Arts, the College of Arts and Letters, the Mendoza College of Business, the Glenn Family Honors Program, the Center for Social Concerns, Learning Beyond the Classroom, and the Department of Classics and Gender Studies programs. Thank you as well to Dean Joseph Stanfield, whose guidance and commitment to intellectual engagement led us here tonight. And finally, let me introduce our moderator for tonight, Jim Sturba. Jim has been a professor of philosophy here at Notre Dame since 1985, engaging in discourses on ethics, peace, and justice. He has published many books, written many articles, and edited many, of more, many more of both on these topics, the latest of which with our debaters here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jim as our moderator for this evening. Thanks, Theodora, Megan, and Alex, and thanks to all of you for being here tonight. The initial impetus for tonight's debate was the publication of John Carvino and Maggie Gallagher's book, Debating Same-Sex Marriage, in my debate series with Oxford University Press. Immediately following the publication of the book, John, Maggie, and I concluded that it was important to bring their debate to Notre Dame so we began looking for an opening in, in, in their busy schedules when we could do so. When we eventually settled on October 25th, the Commission on Presidential Debates, which had initially favored that date for the last of the three presidential debates, was good enough to move up their debate to this past Monday, <laughs> so as not to conflict with ours. In addition, surely with our debate in mind, the Federal Appeals Court in New York timed its ruling striking down the federal law prohibiting same-sex marriage early enough so that their decision might also come up in the discussion of our, in our debate tonight. Now, it's difficult to know how to put the central thesis at issue into tonight's debate. In a recent public appearance, Maggie Gallagher was asked to state the issue as she thinks John Corvino sees it. And she put it something like this. For John Corvino, gays and lesbians can have the same interests in intimate relationships and forming families as heterosexuals do, and so they should have the same institutional supports, namely those provided by legal marriage, for doing so. In that same public appearance, John Corvino 
when asked to state the issue as he thinks Maggie Gallagher sees it, put it something like this. For Maggie Gallagher, marriage has traditionally been limited to a union between a man and a woman because children are best cared for by their mothers and fathers. If the institution of marriage is changed to allow same-sex unions, that central purpose of marriage will be undercut and children will not be as well cared for. In addition, those who believe that marriage should serve this central purpose will become marginalized and even discriminated against. So that is one way of framing the opposing views in this debate. Let me now introduce our speakers. Dr. John Carvino is chair of the philosophy department at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and a nationally known speaker in LGBT issues. For years, he was also known as the gay moralist, a regular columnist for 365day.com and other venues. His writing has appeared in dozens of scholarly journals and books, including Do We Need Minority Rights, Ethics in Practice, and The Philosophy of Sex. Ms. Maggie Gallagher is past chair and co-founder of the National Organization for, for Marriage, the preeminent national organization fighting to protect marriage as the union of husband and wife. She is a nationally syndicated columnist and the author of three books on marriage, including with Linda Waithe, The Case for Marriage, Why Married People Are Happier, Healthier, and, be and Financially Better Off. The structure of tonight's debate will be as follows. Carvino will start taking about 15 minutes to defend gay marriage, followed by Gallagher, who will take about 15 minutes to oppose gay marriage. Each will then get seven to 10 minutes for a rebuttal. After that, we'll have about 40 minutes for questions from the audience. There are two microphones um, on each side of, of the stage. Uh, if you have a question for either speaker, Please line up during the question period in an orderly fashion behind the mics. The first four questioners will be Notre Dame students. After the debate, there will be a book signing outside. The debate will, will be, is being videotaped and, and it will uh, you'll be available on YouTube and on the Gender Studies website. Please remember that although the debate is on a contentious topic, our goal tonight is to have an intellectually serious discussion. So feel free to applaud the speakers, but please refrain from booing, interrupting, throwing eggs or fruit, or otherwise disrupting the event. With that in mind, let us begin. I give you John Cravina. Good evening. It is a great pleasure and privilege to be here at the University of Notre Dame, and especially to be here with my friend Maggie Gallagher. People are often surprised to hear me refer to Maggie as my friend. They say, how can you, as a gay rights advocate and as a gay man yourself, be friends with someone who is actively fighting against your right to marry the person you love? And the answer to that question is quite simple. I drink. <laughs> a lot. No, actually the answer to that question is complicated, but an important part of the answer to that question is that while Maggie and I disagree on this issue, and it's an important issue, we agree that issues like this deserve a careful, thoughtful discussion. And so we welcome the opportunity to have that with each other, and with all of you. So thank you for being here to be part of that. As we think about this issue, there are some basic facts that I'd like us to keep in mind. First, there are gay people in the world. They are our friends and neighbors, our fellow students, our family members, our fellow citizens. Second, gay people find happiness in same-sex relationships. You might not like it, you might not even understand it, but so it goes. Third, when they find that happiness, it does not take anything away from you. Unless you were planning on being with one of them yourself. <laughs> in which case you should be glad we figured this out now. <laughs> it does not take anything away from you. Giving marriage to gay people does not mean taking it away from straight people. It's not like there's a limited number of marriage licenses, and once we run out of them, they're gone. 
Fourth, relationships are good for people. This is something, actually, that I don't think we spend enough time talking about. People say, oh, it makes you happy. Yes, but it's not just about the subjective pleasure of it. A relationship can get us outside of ourselves, can help us grow at its best. It can be an avenue toward making us better people. When we have someone to come home to at night, to wake up with in the morning, to share life's joys and sorrows and challenges with, to commit to for better or for worse until death do we part, this is good for people. And that's as true for gay people as it is for straight people. Fifth, marriage is good for relationships. It does this in a number of ways. Socially, what it does is it involves your standing before your family and friends and committing to someone for life, and your family and friends holding you to that in a certain way. So there's a web of expectations that helps sustain the relationship over the long haul. And that's one way in which marriage is good for relationships. But also, marriage does certain things legally for relationships. By creating legal next of kin, by establishing the couple as family in the eyes of the law. So that if one person is in the hospital, the other person can visit or make decisions in the event of incapacity. So that if one person dies, the other person can make funeral decisions or get bereavement leave. So if one person is the breadwinner, the other one can get social security benefits. So if one person is a foreigner, the other one can help get citizenship status or residency status for that person. It might not seem like a big deal to you unless you happen to fall in love with someone who's not an American citizen. If one person gets into legal trouble, the other one cannot be forced to testify against that person. It might not seem like a big deal to you unless you happen to be dating a criminal. <laughs> but what it does is it creates a kind of zone of privacy around the relationship that straight couples frankly take for granted and that gay couples do not have access to. And if the couple splits up, as couples sometimes do, there's a set of laws in place to help that go more smoothly. It's not perfect, and any of you who have ever experienced divorce in any way know that it's not perfect, but it's something. Gay people don't have that. And we don't often think about the fact that one important reason for gay marriage is gay divorce, so that there's some system in place after people have melded their lives and their property to help take that apart in those unfortunate cases. But now, sixth and finally, what is good for the couples in this way is also good for society at large. And this is another important step in the relationship because some people might say, yeah, the relationships, they make people happy, but what's in it for society? And one thing I'd say in response to that is, well, gay people are a part of our society. Remember, they're friends and neighbors and family members and so on, and anything that helps them but doesn't take anything away from anyone else is a gain to society. But there's more to it than that because happy, stable couples make happy, stable neighbors. When there's someone whose job it is to take care of you and vice versa, that means that your neighbor and that the state is less likely to have to do that. So in my view, this is a kind of win-win situation. It's good for the couples themselves, but also good for society at large because society has an interest in promoting and encouraging this kind of stable commitment for all of its members, gay and straight alike. So why is this such a controversial issue? Well, people often bring up religion in the context of this, and I expect that that's particularly relevant at a place like Notre Dame. And I want to be very clear that when Maggie and I discuss marriage tonight, we are discussing civil marriage, something that the state does, which is different from religious or sacramental marriage, something that your church or other religious institution does. I think in this country it's hard for people to separate these things in their minds. We use the same word, marriage, for both. And typically people who want both get them done at the same time. They fill out the relevant paperwork in City Hall, they go before a religious minister, and as long as they file the paperwork later, they are simultaneously married both in the eyes of that religious institution and in the eyes of the state. Not every country does it this way. My in-laws had two weddings in the Philippines, one in a Catholic church, one a month later in a courthouse before a judge. I want to make it clear that whatever we do with respect to civil marriage, 
it will not dictate what your church or other religious institution must do with respect to religious marriage. No church will be forced to perform weddings it does not want to perform any more than it's forced to perform baptisms or confirmations or bar mitzvahs or anything like that that it doesn't want to perform. And that's always been true. Your church may not allow remarriage after divorce. The state can't force it to. Your church may not allow interfaith marriage. The state can't force it to. And your church may not allow same-sex marriage. The state can't force it to. If we live in a society where we genuinely believe in the freedom of religion, that means that the debate over civil marriage should be based on arguments that are, in principle, accessible to people of all faiths and no faith at all. So then when we look at some of those non-religious arguments, what do we hear? Well, some people say if we allow same-sex couples to marry, that will be a threat to traditional marriage. I've been doing this for a long time. Honestly, I don't get this argument. Do we think that if we support gay people in their relationships, people will stop having straight relationships and all go gay? <laughs> the usual response to a gay person is not, hey, no fair. <laughs> How come he gets to be gay? <laughs> Do we think that if we support same-sex marriage, straight people will give up on the institution of marriage? What's that dinner conversation going to look like? Well, Jane, I wanted to marry you, but now the guys next door are getting married, so forget it. <laughs> we can support traditional heterosexual marriage while recognizing that it is not right for everyone, and we don't do anybody any favors by pressuring them into situations that they're not suited for. We don't do gay people any favors, don't do the people they marry or their families any favors. Then people say to me, well, if we allow same-sex marriage, why not polygamy? Why not incest? Why not bestiality? Why not this slippery slope to all these other things? This, again, is an argument that I find perplexing. I always want to know, what does one thing have to do with the other? I mean, polygamy can be heterosexual or homosexual, and in fact, the societies that practice it, it's very common in history, the societies that practice it tend to be among the least accepting of same-sex relationships. Incest can be heterosexual or homosexual. Bestiality, I suppose, can be heterosexual or homosexual. <laughs> I prefer not to think about it that carefully. <laughs> so what does one thing have to do with the other? People say, well, if you make one change to marriage, why not make any other change to marriage? To which my response is, because each change must be evaluated on its own merits. Whether it's a good idea to allow people to marry one unrelated person of the same sex is a different question from whether it's a good idea for them to be allowed to marry multiple partners or their relatives or their pets or what have you. And frankly, I think the people who bring up that slippery slope are just changing the subject. Well, okay, what about the issue of children? Many people say we should not allow same-sex couples to marry because children need a mother and father. Now, in many ways, I think that this is the worst kind of argument. It proceeds from what is not true to what does not follow. So let me say a little bit more about this, but what is not true? The premise, children need a mother and father. We know that children actually can do well in a number of different family forms. In fact, our current president was raised by a single mother. People say, well, I say children need a mother and father. I don't mean that children need a mother and father. I mean that that is the optimal situation for child rearing, for them to be in their own intact biological family in a low conflict relationship. Now, frankly, it's not entirely clear whether that claim is true in an unqualified way. When we compare intact same sex couples with intact different sex couples controlling for other variables, we find the children do just as well either way. You don't have to take my word for that. The American Academy of Pediatrics has said the same thing. You don't believe them? How about the American Psychological Association? the National Association of Social Workers, the Child Welfare League of America, the American Medical Association, every major health and welfare organization that has commented on this issue has said the same thing. The children, there don't appear to be marked differences between the two cases. I don't want to play the, source of the, the game of my sources can beat up your sources. But if we look at mainstream social science, this claim about optimal parenting is, is under-supported at best. But suppose you disagree. Suppose you think that all of those organizations are wrong and that that is the optimal situation for childbearing. The conclusion about same-sex marriage still would not follow. Why? Because same-sex marriage never takes children away from competent biological parents who want them. 
It's not that by letting me marry, you give me license to kidnap children from their own biological parents. <laughs> so in a way, I think we're asking the wrong question. The question is not, where do kids do better in same-sex families or in different sex families? The question is, would allowing same-sex couples to marry improve child welfare or hurt child welfare? And prohibiting same-sex couples to marry is not going to mean that any more children get the intact biological family that's supposed to be optimal. No more children are going to get that just because we prohibit same-sex couples to marry. But what will happen is that all of the children who are currently being raised by same-sex couples, couples who often give them homes, take them out of foster care when they're difficult to place, do not get the security and support of marriage. So if child welfare is really our concern, we should be supporting marriage for same-sex couples, not discouraging it. And then finally, people say, well, look, even apart from that, all that social science data, it's just wrong. And I say, why is it wrong? And they say, because it's unnatural. Now, we have to be clear on what we mean by this, right? And why it matters. Think about all of the unnatural things you've done today. <laughs> You woke up this morning. Did you wait for a rooster to crow? No, you probably set an alarm clock. Alarm clock's not natural. You bathed, I hope. <laughs> Did you jump in St. Joseph's Lake? No, you probably used plumbing, took a shower. Not natural. If you're in a building, not natural. Listening to me on a microphone, not natural. The wall is a color of red that appears nowhere in nature. <laughs> nature in some way, but when people say homosexuality is unnatural, that somehow stops the debate. So when I ask people to elaborate on this, and they say, well, the natural purpose of sex and marriage is procreation. Well, it's pretty clear to me that a natural purpose of sex and marriage is procreation, but the only natural purpose? I mean, I'm as aware of basic biological facts as everyone else, but I also know that straight people often have sex even when they don't want children don't want children yet, don't want any more children, or can't have children. Why? Because it seems that sex has these other important purposes. Expression of affection, sharing of intimacy. Now, when we're talking about marriage, yes, I mean, one very important purpose of marriage is procreation and providing a good home for children. But what do we say to infertile heterosexual couples, including elderly couples who get married? That it's pointless? And people say, well, no, it's no, because it's still, they're still the kind of people who could have children. To which I say, no, as infertile couples, they are precisely the kind of people who cannot have children. That's why we call them infertile couples. And then people say to me, yeah, but it's still different. And I ask them, why is it different? And they say, plumbing. Plumbing? Yes, plumbing. The parts don't fit. <laughs> and when people say to me, the parts don't fit, I have a very simple response. Yes, they do. <laughs>
figuring out where you are. And then I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I became the lady that fights gay marriage, a job title I never expected would exist when I was young. Um, and, and then I want to not so much, I mean, I, the, the number of things on which I disagree with John are actually as I sit and listen to him speak, this is not my first time, it's really quite large. But I don't want to spend my time rebutting. What I want to do is spend my time trying to make, especially those of you who disagree with me, trying to make the case for marriage at least visible to you in a new way. <clears throat> so let me start by asking, um, how many, I'm going to ask how many people are inclined to support gay marriage, how many people are inclined to oppose it, and how many people are either uncertain or think it's really none of my business, which is not any of my business, so that's fine as an answer, okay? So for a show of hands, how many people are inclined to support same-sex marriage? And how many people are opposed? Thank you. And how many people are either uncertain or think they should not be asked to say? Okay, thanks very much. So as I suspected, for most of you, this might be um, an opportunity to hear why so many of your fellow Americans, again and again, have a problem uh, with gay marriage. And uh, this includes many, if you look at the polling data, it's very clear, it includes many Americans who have goodwill towards the gay people who are their friends, their neighbors, their fellow citizens, and their family members. But there's something about marriage which is different. So this is my chance, my, uh, my effort at least, to try to let you at least glimpse how the world looks. Um, because the, there are two big questions in the gay marriage debate, and they actually take us in a bit different uh, direction. The first question, the question that most people who are for gay marriage think a lot about, is what do we think about gay people? And gay marriage has emerged as a kind of symbol of acceptance and social concern for gay and uh, rights for gay people in society. 25 years ago, it wasn't a symbol for even for most gay people, probably. But today, that's what it is. And um, my position is hard to articulate if you've adopted that hard framing because my position is not that uh, gay people should not be allowed to marry. My position is actually that. It goes to the question, what is marriage? Is there a reason why marriage is defined as, understood as, rooted in the phenomenon of male-female sexual, romantic, and social attraction? Does it, what purpose does thinking about marriage in this way serve? And uh, so it's not a circular argument. It is not simply marriage is defined this way, therefore we can't think about it. What I believe is that marriage is the union of husband, in the short version, marriage is the union of husband and wife for a reason. And yes, it's because these are the unions that we all count on to make new life. The only unions that can connect a child in love to their mother and father. I got into this gay marriage debate in a bit unusual way. Um, back in 1982, when I was a senior at Yale, and a pro-life atheist, I got pregnant. Um, and so I had my uh, first son. Uh, his father was a Yale student, a year younger than me. And I was very concerned that I'd not interfere with his education. Um, so we kind of kind of scuttled along, and I, uh, my parents supported me, and I tried to figure out how to uh, work and take care of my son. Um, and then in three years later, four years later, he was, was about three years old, in 1986, um, my son's father called me up and said uh, that it was just too much for him, he couldn't take it anymore, which was kind of puzzling to me because frankly he wasn't really doing very much. Um, <laughs> but anyway, as I said, that was 86 and neither my son nor I have seen or heard from him since. Now, when my older son graduated from college, I did go online and start Googling, and I found out that he is a surgeon in New Hampshire who married and has a son who's probably 13 or 14 at this point. So that launched me into thinking, you know, when I never imagined that uh, you had, to, I didn't know, I really literally did not know why you need to be married in order to get a father for your child. And 
Reflecting back on that, I think that's because in the family I was raised in, which is, um, was originally a Catholic family, but my mother left the church in 1968 um, when I was eight. Uh, that, but was a product of Catholic family culture, I, I would say the best of Catholic family culture. And the idea that your father might not be there for you was just not in my moral imagination. I did, I, you know, the idea that your father would abandon you, for me personally, was like men could come down from Mars and shoot you with little guns. It just was not something that I thought happened to people that you know, which was kind of dumb of me, given I was a Yale girl. But anyway, so I got interested in the 1980s was the time when all of the smart people, all the elites, they put on their white jackets, and they said, look, look at all this divorce, look at all this unmarried childbearing, look at all these families falling apart. Isn't this wonderful? This represents a discarding of unnecessary moral norms that hurt women and interfere with our freedom. And um, I kind of started thinking about, because of my own experience, and because of my experience with the son, and two things became clear to me very fast. The first is that it's really hard to raise children on your own. I think I was pretty good at it. I was also the world's most privileged unwed mother. I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I had a Yale degree. I had uh, parents who were not only together, warm and supportive, uh, but affluent. So I had a lot of backup. <clears throat> and, uh, but it was really hard. And the second thing I learned uh, very early is that by the time my son was like three, he began to ask, where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? Why isn't he here? Way before it had anything to do with social stigmas, right? There's something um, very deep in the human heart uh, about this. And I think I came to believe, and you know, this is the same time when the social science evidence, which in the 70s, just as it is now with gay parenting, is uniformly very supportive and said it was a wonderful thing and there's a period of adjustment, but then everything's fine began to shift and you began to see concern. And um, so, and the social science evidence to shift forward maybe another 10 years as it began to accumulate, basically we discovered that contrary to what all of the smart people were saying in 1982, that in every way we know how to measure, uh, children are at risk if their parents don't get and stay married and build a basically decent average, good enough marriage. So higher rates of poverty, higher rates of welfare dependency, higher rates of uh, juvenile delinquency, leading to higher rates of adult criminality. You have more behavior problems, you have more problems in school, you're more likely to be held back a grade, you're less likely to be, um, to graduate from high school. If you graduate from high school, you're less likely to go to college and graduate from college. Higher rates of mental illness, distress, infant mortality, uh, depression, uh, teen suicide, the, 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 the increased risk of teen suicide among gay children, which is a, a horrifying thing to me personally, is around the same level that children whose parents divorce when they're teenagers go through, by the way. I mean, I don't know the exact figures, but they're at a similar rate of elevation. So with my own son, though, I knew very fast that it was, I didn't, never really worried that he'd become one of these social science statistics, right? I didn't think he's gonna become a high school dropout or a drug dealer, and indeed he's grown up to become a wonderful man who's capable, as, as the vast majority of children raised by single mothers are, good people capable of work and love. But still, I could see that he suffered, that I wasn't able to give him what my mother and father working together were able to give me. And I've come to conclude that every child who is raised outside of a stable, good enough, average, I don't like to say a good marriage, because I just mean an average marriage, where there's love and caretaking and basic respect, but there can be a lot of other things too, like boredom and frustration and a certain amount of anger and temptation, because that's part of life, right? Just your average marriage protects children and is worth having and doing. And, um, I, t you know, I, I, could, I believe that every child who's raised without his mother and father has two big questions, even those that do fine and do well, that they have to wrestle with. Um, the first is, uh, since most of these children are raised by their mothers, and like my son, lose their fathers, um, what does male love feel like? What is its relationship to me? Is love a feminine characteristic? And 
What does that mean for me as a, as a girl or for me as a boy? They process it differently. And the second question, it's not hard to get theological fast, is that children ask themselves is, why is it that one half of the people who made me doesn't seem to love me? What does that say about me? What does that say about love and its relationship to creation and the universe? So I plunge into this other debate about marriage, which had nothing to do about gay people, but has to do with what I think is the great crisis in our society, the marriage crisis. Uh, for some reason, every, it's not just in America, it's in every developed society, does not seem to know how to do what every small, dumb tribe, I'm just not sure that was politically correct, what every small tribal society, less technologically sophisticated, knows how to do, which is bring together male, enough men and women to make and raise their children together to transmit the society into the future. And um, I got into the gay marriage, so I, I wrote some books and I worked with scholars, and, but really I went around the country saying some of this, the dumb way to put what I was doing. So I went around the country saying, marriage really matters because children need their mom and dad, right? And uh, I avoided gay marriage for most of that time until suddenly it, the Massachusetts court made it a reality. And I felt that the people who knew and understood and cared about marriage needed to engage this debate because it's not just a debate about what we think about gay people. It's also a debate about what marriage is, what its purposes are, and whether those purposes are still relevant in the post-modern post -post age. I think the postmodern age was when I was young, so I'm 52, so we must be in a different age, but it doesn't have a name yet. So here's what I went. I went around, this is the, the short version of my case for why marriage is the union of husband and wife. The place for me to start is to recognize that marriage is a virtually universal human social institution. It exists in almost every known human society. There is literally one tribe in China where the anthropologists quibble about whether they have any form of marriage. And it's not always the same. Many, many things that we take for granted about marriage are specific to our culture. And marriage evolves and changes over time. And yet, over and over again, in completely different societies, there, it, there's a certain basic shape that emerges over and over again. Mar marriage is a public union. It's not just a private and personal union, not just between the two lovers to work out on their own. Uh, it's a sexual union, it's not some other kind of union. Relationships are extremely important, but we have many, many different kinds of important relationships. Marriage is a sexual union. Um, between at least a man and a woman, and I have to say at least one and man and one woman, because polygamy is frankly a fairly common uh, variant, especially among small tribal societies in which the rights and responsibilities of the man and the woman towards each other and any children of their union are publicly defined and supported, which means we do not leave it up to young adults and adolescents in the middle of their sexual, erotic, romantic, spiritual, psychological dramas to try to figure out on their own what this whole big dimension of human experience means. Now, I'm not saying that just because marriage has been like this in every known human society, we can't change it. I'm asking you to ask yourself why. There aren't that many human universals. Why is it that over and over again, societies with completely different religions, ecologies, economies, histories, geographies, why do they come up with something you know, that's recognizably this basic marriage idea? The answer is that marriage is rooted everywhere in three persistent truths about human beings. Okay? The first is that the overwhelming majority of us are powerfully attracted and not by reason to an act that makes new human life, new flesh. Sex between men and women makes babies. Um, the second idea on which marriage is based is that society needs babies. It's not every individual has to do it. Reproduction is optional for the individual but only those cultures that figure out ways, institutional ways, public norms, visible ways to manage the procreate, persistent procreative implication of male-female sexual desire succeed to become one of those possibilities that our anthropologists went out and busily recorded. The third idea on which marriage is based is that children deserve to have a father as well as a mother. 
And it is uh, fatherhood, really, which is most at stake in our marriage debate. And this is not because I believe <clears throat> women are more important than men or men are important than women. We've had a, so again, since I was a young girl, a big debate about gender, which is very, very important. But put it aside for the moment, because the truth I'm pointing to is um, simpler. Put it this way. When a baby is born, there is bound to be a mother somewhere close by, right? If we want fathers to be there for the children and for the mothers of their children, biology alone will not take us very far. We need a, me a cultural mechanism for attaching fathers to the mother-child for bond and for communicating to both young men and women that there's something really important in their state, at stake in their sexual and romantic relationships that they're going to have to, you know, act in some disciplined and effortful ways, if not sacrificial ways, in order to get this great good for the child. child. Because we know the default uh, situation, we see it in neighborhoods all over America, of a culture in which marriage does not, is not organized around this idea and does not have this power. The default position of male-female romantic and sexual relationships in the absence of a powerful <coughs> ideal that children, marriage really matters because children need their mom and a dad, is that children will continue, in spite of contraception and in spite of abortion, children will continue to be conceived on an irregular but quite frequent basis. Um, so here's how marriage protects children. It is not that there's a bunch of benefits that the government gives you that trickle down and protect the children. Marriage protects children because every time a man and a woman who are attracted to the opposite sex marry, that act itself is protecting children because it means neither of them will be creating fatherless, if they are true to their vows, neither of them will be creating fatherless children across multiple households. And moreover, if they conceive a child, whether that child is actively planned or not, the overwhelming majority of those children will begin life with a mother and father already pre-committed to caring for them in the same household. And I would point out that this is not some archaic relic. It is, my, it is the common human experience. Even today, three quarters of all births are unintended by at least one of their parents, right? So that's the case. Marriage is a union of husband and wife. Marital unions are those that can serve this. this is the, first of all, this is the reason why government's in the marriage business. I mean, it's really weird that government is in the marriage business if you have another vision of what marriage is. Because frankly, the way we show how sacred and important relationships are, and they are, there's lots of really important relationships in your lives. Mostly the government's not involved in any of them. The government doesn't touch adult relationships. The reason why, and here I have to say, this is a, um, we're all entitled to our opinions of what marriage should be in the future. But the history of marriage in this country, the legal history of marriage, is littered with attestations that managing procreation so that children are not born out of wedlock in fatherless homes that hurt them and become a burden on the community, or at least are less likely to. And so the children are raised in homes that are more likely to be successful with the mother and father raising them together. This has been articulated as the purpose of marriage and law over and over. We didn't make it up because we don't like gay people. Um, so we're not, uh, so what happens with same-sex marriage? Why, why, why can't we just include a few extra people and have the institution go on just the same? This is John's basic vision. It will fulfill the same purpose for, for opposite-sex couples as for same-sex couples. It won't change anything. Um, to, to believe that, I mean, to understand why I don't believe that, you have to believe that ideas have cons consequences. Marriage as a legal contract is really not very significant. Very few of us, now it's true if you fall in love with a criminal, you might want that. But frankly, most of the legal structures that, uh, even the ones that John just described to you, have very little to do with what people expect, want, or need in marriage. The legal contract is not nearly as important. In fact, it, it used to be very important because it was the only way you could legally have sex. But that hasn't been true for about 60 or 70 years. So what happens if we change the norms and change the idea that there's something special about husbands and wives, that we have a stake in this relationship, that we don't have as a, a communal stake, that we don't have in other kinds of relationships? 
Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that the law is going to repudiate what I think it should be strengthening. So, I mean, I read this emerged for me as a practical problem. I was like, I'm going around the country making some progress because I'm saying marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad. Now, when I go to, what happens if Massachusetts adopts gay marriage? What happens when I go there and I try to make the case that marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad? People are going to look up and they're going to say, well, that's not the purpose of marriage because same-sex couples are married. So obviously marriage has nothing to do with getting mothers and fathers for children. What are you talking about, Maggie, right? And you can bring up the example of infertile couples, but I will guarantee you, again, as a matter of recent historical fact, that when I spent 20 years going around the country saying this, there is no one in the audience who ever raised the problem of infertile couples and said, that repudiates the idea that marriage has something to do with bringing men and women to make and raise the next generation. Um, uh, married couples without children are part of the natural life cycle of marriage. You actually don't know, infertile is not, there are some couples who cannot absolutely have any children, but mostly when even, you don't know if you're infertile when you marry, and even if you are infertile, you could have, have children. So, I think we at the minimum, I would like you to consider accepting that same-sex marriage really is doing something new to our public understanding of marriage. It's not just fitting more people under the same thing. We have to change the classic understanding of marriage if gay couples are going to be considered a union. And then as John alluded to, I think it gets worse because I think that these, the, the classic understanding of marriage is not only going to be repudiated, it's going to be actively oppressed by law, culture, and society after same-sex marriage. Now, why do I think that? Because I think the heart of the gay marriage idea goes something like this. There is no morally relevant difference between same-sex and opposite-sex couples when it comes to marriage and its purposes. And if you see a difference, there's something wrong with you. You're like a bigot who's opposed to interracial marriage. And I, I'm not objecting to the words. I'm not saying people are being mean when they say this. I'm asking you to take seriously and work out the consequences of the fundamental idea that you're asking government to endorse in law and culture and society. So the, 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 the view of marriage that I think, precisely the view of marriage that I think we ought to be strengthening is instead going to be increasingly difficult, uh, even for private actors, to strengthen because it's going to be equated with interracial marriage. It is going to be viewed as a, um, as a stigmatized, marginalized, wicked idea, frankly. The idea that the ideal for a child is a married mom and dad. Now, I'm not that concerned when I make this argument. I think this is hard for gay marriage advocates because the debate is so much, and understandably, but it's so much about gay people. I'm not primarily concerned about trying to interfere with how gay people live their lives or preventing them from loving people or even preventing them from forming families. Um, the, I'm concerned about what happens in the rest of society in a culture in which the idea that the ideal for a child is a married mother and father it, is treated as the equivalent of somebody who thinks interracial marriage is wrong, right? The, the norms around which marriage is going to be organized and faced are going to be changed, and they're going to be adapted. And exactly the norm I think we need to be strengthening. I mean, marriage is, I want a soulmate. I want to, you know, I want to give caretaking love between two adults. That idea we don't need to support and strengthen more, in my opinion. That, sometimes it's a fantasy, actually, but in any case, that is an ideal that society is doing well. This other idea, the marriage matters, and adults ought to be willing to sacrifice if necessary. Not an unlimited sacrifice, perhaps, but they ought to, this is a really important good to get for your child, and you really have an obligation to do it if you possibly can. And that obligation includes sacrificing if necessary, sometimes. And I will tell you that I think most marriages that last involve a certain amount of sacrifice, um, even the best of them. So that's it. That's it. I, I like to say that I hope that I'm wrong about what gay marriage means for marriage. 
and for this classic understanding of marriage. But if I am wrong, it's going to be up to you. It's going to be up to you young people who are for gay marriage to try to figure out what I have not been able to figure out. I have not been, because, because what I see playing out even right now is a strengthening and an intensification of this idea that there's no possible reason why marriage was ever the union of husband and wife, and that people who cling to that idea are doing so only out of hatred and animus towards gay people. And increasingly now, I begin to see, I predicted this 10 years ago, I thought it would take a lot longer. We see people losing their jobs because they tweet that they don't believe in gay marriage, or uh, there's a, uh, Chief Diversity Officer of Gallaudet University, who's the first black PhD who was suspended when the president found out that she had signed a petition to put marriage to a vote. She had never expressed her opinion on how she would vote, actually, but just signing the petition led to her, to be, her job to be suspended. The thing that bothers me the most, I'll tell you, is what happened after Illinois adopted the civil union law, where Equality Illinois promised that it would not affect religious adoption agencies. But that turned out to be totally untrue. That you know, there's most adoption agencies uh, do gay adoptions in Illinois. There's just a couple. There's Catholic Charities. There's Evangelical Lutheran that, in being true to their faith tenets, um, do not put children in the home of same-sex couples. And uh, for years, it was well understood. If you were gay, you knew which adoption agencies did them, and you knew which ones didn't, and you didn't go to Catholic Charities if you wanted a child. And that seems, from the point of view of the civil government, to make a lot of sense, you know? Um, but uh, immediately after the civil union law was passed, registered civil union couples went to these religious adoption agencies and asked for uh, children, were, were politely referred to other adoption agencies, and uh, then the claim was made that this was discrimination and that no gay person could feel good in Illinois knowing that uh, the government was willing to cooperate with Catholic charities. And I wonder why it never occurred to anyone whether any Catholic in Illinois could feel good that the government is no longer allowed to cooperate with Catholic institutions, but that's another question. What really bothers me about it uh, is that it was, an, you know, what, what I'm watching for is, am I wrong? Is this principle, this idea, this underlying idea going to be applied in a straightforward way, something wrong with you. If you don't see gay couples the same as straight couples, you're a discriminator. And here's the heart, what ought to be the easiest case to make an exception, because we're talking about children who have no parents at all, right? The most vulnerable children. And it seems to me, you know, back in the 90s, the argument was it's better off for children to be, even if you don't believe in gay adoption, it's better off for them to be with gay people than with uh, no homes at all. And everyone kind of shrugged and mostly said, went, went along with that, right? Here it seems to me that the more adoption agencies who do good work recruiting couples and helping find homes, the better off these children are. You know, we have a situation that worked. But the, more, the new moral public norm was applied. The religious adoption agencies were told they could no longer work with foster care children. You cannot, foster care children only come through the government. And um, it was a very bad sign for me about where we're headed in terms of these relative values. I don't think gay marriage is about live and let live as it is now being enacted. Maybe John would do differently, maybe you would do differently. Um, but if we're going to live in a society where the things I really deeply care about are respected and are allowed to be strengthened, we're gonna have to change course pretty quick. Thank you for listening to me, I appreciate it. quick. There's a way of understanding Maggie Gallagher's argument that may sound like a caricature of the argument, but I'm not sure that it is. Fundamental premise within the argument is that men leave. I mean, you heard Maggie say when a child is born, a mother is likely to near, be nearby, but men don't always stick around to care for their children. They sometimes leave. And we need this institution of marriage to keep the parents around, but particularly to pressure the fathers to stick around in order to care for their children, because children deserve to have both their father and their mother. Now, there are a couple things, I think, in reaction to this. 
One is a sort of a very dismal view of men. Another is that it's kind of an impoverished view of marriage. But mainly it's, okay, so what does this have to do with gay people? And Maggie's answer to this is that essentially, as I understand it, and again, this might be a caricature, but I don't think so. If we accept that same-sex couples can be married, then marriage is no longer focused exclusively, or at least almost exclusively, on pressuring men to stick around for their offspring, but it's about something else. It's about adult sharing of life. It's about commitment, but without the biological connections. It's about love and happiness. It's about something, but not about that. And I think that Maggie is setting up a false dilemma. Because actually, I agree with her that a very important function of marriage is to get people, particularly fathers, to stick around and care for their offspring. But how does it do this? It does this by saying that this person that you're committing to, you're committing to for keeps. This is serious, and we, your family and friends who stand around you, are going to hold you to it. Now, that's important for biological offspring. It's also important for offspring who are not biologically related to the parents, for other children who may be in the household. And frankly, it's also important for childless adults to have someone there for keeps. So basically what I want to say is, I think Maggie Gallagher has picked the wrong battle. That if the concern is really get fathers to stick around for their children, I'm right there with her. But there's still room for love and commitment and support for people who are not having children, including same-sex couples. There is enough love and commitment to go around. There is enough marriage to share. so he likes to produce uh, a caricature, but it's so unrelated in my own head to what I want to leave you with, whether you're gay or straight. I don't think marriage is a punishment we inflict on men because children need fathers. Um, and I also don't think that the human body is as insignificant. You know, this is another thing I don't know how to say yet, but there's something about describing the human body and its meaning as plumbing. They're really, I think, you know, it's good for a laugh there, but you're missing something really important, John. Um, and something that gay people don't really believe either. I mean, I, I hear the argument made all the time that the reason we should have gay marriage is we don't think gender matters anymore. And I'm like, well, if gender doesn't matter, then John, why don't you marry a woman? Because there's no difference between men and women. Um, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. We don't know how to explain how either the body or biology matters. And then we create these caricatures, these all or nothing caricatures. Um, one thing I haven't ever really heard John say is whether he thinks that marriage, the ideal for a child, is a married mom and dad. Uh, because I, I haven't ever met a gay marriage advocate who can say that. And they can't say it because, not because they don't care about fathers staying around for their children. There's, I mean, there's a lot of common ground we can find. They can't say it, I think, because I'm not incorrect that the dominant motive for gay marriage is not solving practical problems for gay people. That's important to gay people. I'm not saying it isn't. But the dominant, the, 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 the energy and the impulse for gay marriage is about establishing this new public moral norm, which is there is, which is to, to look at sexual orientation, we're really borrowing it, the, the way we look at race, and to uh, experience, therefore, uh, any, um, certainly any public institution that treats gay and straight people in any way differently as an insult to gay people and as an insult to this new public norm. I, 
understand that, and I'm not, this is what people believe, this is what they believe. But I haven't figured out how you can combine that with the idea that we have a special stake in the unions of husbands and wives. Because frankly, you know, 99% of children are produced by acts of sexual passion. And uh, we need to both idealize what it takes um, to create and sustain a marriage culture, which is more about getting mothers and fathers for children, and less about idealizing adult romantic love and caretaking, not because ideal love and romantic caretaking are not good things, they are. And they're important parts of marriage. It's the way you protect children, is by getting men and women to pledge their love to each other. And I will say, I don't want to delve too much in the social science uh, literature except to say, we do not know how children raised by two gay fathers will fare. And it doesn't look like we much care or view that as central to this debate. We don't have a single study that looks at how motherless children, deliberately motherless children fare compared to other children. But it doesn't seem to matter to us at this point. And that, as a woman, that bothers me. We have not, we really don't have a single study, even with lesbian mothers who have been the subject of most of this research, that looks at how, takes a, what you call a probability sample, a random, a nationally representative sample of children in this novel family form, follows them to adulthood, compares how they do to other families, and, and uh, so that we can say with some scientific competence what we endlessly repeat, which is that there is absolutely no difference, that it's not important. Um, and the, the lack of a probability sample is important because I say to myself, if I were a lesbian mom and my people were in the great civil rights battle um, of the century and my children were having a lot of problems, would I volunteer to remain in these studies and tell the researchers all about the problems in my, I wouldn't do it. So we just don't know how the average child fares in these, in these family farms. And that does bother me, actually, because of the extreme confidence with which we're asserting this new norm. But fundamentally, the case I'm making is that, I mean, let, let me say, what would the world look like for gay people in Maggie Gallagher's ideal universe? And the first thing I care about a lot is that I don't think gay people should be afraid, right? I don't want a society, I, I just as I don't think unwed mothers should be afraid, right? I've staked my life uh, so far on the idea that through an ideal and an institution that supports that ideal, we can accomplish without fear, right? People are gonna live in a lot of different forms um, and I don't want gay people to feel afraid. If I can win this debate that marriage is not rooted in animus and discrimination, our classic understanding of marriage is based on real and enduring human needs, then we'd still have a problem, as John would say, or an opportunity is another way of looking at it. There is a small number of people who are gay. They don't fit the marriage culture. They don't, John doesn't want a wife. I'm not trying to force him into having a wife. And, you know, we would have the opportunity to create new social institutions that address the legitimate social needs of gay people. But they would not be based in the idea that failing to treat same-sex couples, just like opposite-sex couples, represents a violation of this new public norm of equality. And in that uh, world, there might be an opportunity to find a way to be, to, to reach a live and live, let live compromise, where the things I care about and the things that John care about are both be achieved. But I have never yet heard, this is my, maybe you guys all believe that you can, what I was doing to strengthen marriage quite successfully until the gay marriage debate, just going around the country saying, marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad. I don't think that's consistent with the new public norm embedded in gay marriage. And I've not yet heard John explain to me how it can be. But maybe you, the next generation, will come up with some ideas that we old people have not yet figured out. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for questions now. Likes here. Slide up. I'm a dad, but I still don't see why two gay men or two women can fill the roles of a mother and father. Well, first of all, it's a 
social experiment, so we don't, the results aren't in, and we don't know how those children fare on average. I would suspect that marriage is going to be fairly irrelevant to how well those parents do, because you don't get children, children of a gay couple, in the same way. So that would be my first argument. What I would say is that I think a society that, see, part of this is, is there, there's, there's a certain level of numbers here. Now, I, I went in, the, in debating same-sex marriage in the book. I try to figure out in my head, approximately, thank you, John, how um, copies are available for sale afterwards. Um, I try to figure out how many children might be benefited by same-sex marriage. And you know, you start with one half of one percent of all children are in a household uh, with a same-sex couple in it, and then it looks like maybe eighty percent of those children are the product of previous heterosexual relationships. Because it turns out that even gay people find it easier to get children the old-fashioned way. And, um, so those are step parents, and one of the things we know is that children with remarried parents do not do any better. They just don't do any better. Um, on average than children raised by solo mothers. And so then you're, you know, and, and then the rates of entry into gay marriage are even lower for gay couples, even in places like the Netherlands where they've had gay marriage. So it doesn't really look like gay marriage is going to become the norm in the gay community. And then the rates of dissolution are really higher, much higher on average, one and a half to twice as high. So I, I work it out, and it looks like maybe, you know, one fortieth of one percent of children could be benefited from gay marriage. So we're going to change the norms in our society. We're going to renorm, you know, such such that we no longer believe that on average children do better with their mom and dad. That that's the ideal for which marriage is striving to benefit, potentially benefit, you know, this tiny, tiny fraction of the couple. What I really believe is that if we were strongly committed to the idea that marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad. We would turn to John, we would turn to our gay people and say, look, this marriage thing, it's not about you and your relationships. We need, if we lose this norm and this idea, a lot of children are going to be hurt, not because gay people will be raising them, but because we will no longer be committed to this idea and this ideal, and we won't have a social institution that's about that. So, um, even if it's true, if, it, if, it, if we did the research and we could show that children do just as well with two men or two women as with a mom and a dad. It would probably be because there's these enormous selection effects that, you know, gay, gay people are not wrestling with the same problem that marriage is addressing. And um, so I do think that men and women parent differently. What I really think is that children set out in life because we're born male and female because there are two genders, it's a great divide in society, that children have a longing to know their mom and their dad, the people who made them with their bodies. And we don't have a template right now in society for explaining this longing or why it matters. Uh, we do have a template for explaining why adult longings for certain kinds of bodies is important and should be taken care of. But somehow the child's longing for that is something we don't know how to explain to ourselves. But I there's a lot I want to say in response to Maggie, but I also see that there are a lot of people in line, and that question is directed mainly toward her, so I'd rather keep So ask John the question. I'll be quiet. Yeah, uh, so this, this question is also directed uh, mainly towards Maggie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let John answer like, this. <laughs> like um, like uh, Professor Gravino, I wasn't quite sure what the main argument was, so I hope that this is a charitable sketch, but it's, it was something to the effect of, if we allow gay marriage, then it harms this communicative role that marriage has in terms of symbolizing for young people the importance of, you know, heterosexual unions to raise children, these lifelong commitments and all this stuff. Um, and so I guess the, the scenario in which that role is, is hindered by the existence of gay marriage, I guess that's a possibility. Here's another possibility. Um, we legalize gay marriage and young people think, man, gay people fought so hard to get married and now so many of them seem to really appreciate it. Lots of them, despite being biologically unable to have kids, really go out of their way to adopt or, you know, through uh, artificial insemination or whatever to have kids. Um, 
So marriage must be this really great thing that's really important, and raising kids in the context of marriage must be this really great thing that's really important, and I'm straight, so I should go get straight married and have kids. <laughs> no, I don't think that either of those possibilities is very likely. I imagine that things would probably just go on as before if we legalized gay marriage, but what, I'm not sure why we should think that the possibility you're worried about is any more likely than the possibility that I just outlined. And if it's not, then it seems like we should just say, well, it's, it's a wash. <laughs> marriage matters because children need a mom and a dad. I mean, I, I would just say, the case for my, the, you can argue that gay marriage is not making it any worse if you want. But the argument that Jonathan Rauch laid out that gay marriage will strengthen marriage seems to be being empirically refuted everywhere you go, right? I mean, the, the, there is no society that is moving to strengthen marriage as a, you know, a, a, as rooted in the idea that children need a mom and a dad while adopting and embracing gay marriage. I, I think it's very hard to imagine this happening because gay marriage, adopting gay marriage and moving to embrace gay marriage is an embrace of the idea that there's nothing different between gay and straight couples, right? There's, that, that's, that's the heart of the marriage equality. I mean, we don't even call it gay marriage anymore. We changed the idea of marriage equality, a term I don't use because I think all marriages should be treated equally. I, I just do not think a union of two men is a marriage. I think a, a husband is a man who has decided that he's going to commit himself to taking on a woman and uh, discipline his sexual desires to be attractive to a woman and who is committed to uh, care for her and for any children they make. That's what a husband is. I just want to emphatically state that I think that Maggie misrepresents what marriage equality means. It does not mean that there are no relevant differences, including relevant moral differences, between same-sex relationships and different sex relationships. Uh, in fact, I think there are differences between lesbian relationships and gay male relationships and same-sex relationships. I think within e any of those three categories, there are a wide variety of differences. What it means is that they ought to be treated equally under the law, and that's the difference. Not, not only the law, but in culture and society, too. No, culture and society, sure. Oh, well, that covers pretty much all of the ground there is. Right, but that, doesn't mean, <laughs> that does not mean that there are no differences the between them. I think that that's a strong Okay, okay. I guess my question could be answered by both of you, but I'd like Mr. Corbino to answer first, possibly. Um, I was wondering what you guys think about gay, uh, civil unions, because it seems to me, for, especially for you, I mean, you started off your uh, presentation with defining or letting us know that, if there, that there's a difference between or marriage that's sanctioned by the government and marriage that's sanctioned by the church, and for you that seems to be a huge point of understanding, and we, um, I was just wondering what you think about that. So civil unions are something, it was a term that was created by the state of Vermont in the late 90s in order to give the statewide legal incidence of, marriages, of marriage to same-sex couples without calling it marriage. Uh, and various other states did that or also did something called domestic partnerships. And what we found in practice is that when we try to do separate but equal, it never really turns out to be equal. That is, if we really are serious about getting the same package of rights and responsibilities, well, we've got something that does that. It's called marriage, and when we start calling it by something different, it indicates a hierarchy or indicates a difference, and so in practice, it ends up getting treated differently. I would also say, though, that that, civil unions, would be a far cry better than what we have currently in those states. Uh, and so, you know, if you were asking me whether here in Indiana or you know, where I live in Michigan and so on, if, if that were on the table, how I would feel about it, I would say that, that's, that's good progress. Let's over here. Uh, yeah, my question is a little similar to what he just asked, uh, and it's directed to Mr. Corvino. Um, you've said several times uh, marriage um, 
you're not really focused on the religious aspects of it. But I can't draw that distinction because marriage, whether you like to uh, admit it or not, does in fact have religious connotations. Uh, so wouldn't it be better to call what you support or uh, a mere civil union or domestic partnership? Or is that an instance of separate but equal? Well, let me put it this way. If you go to the courthouse with a woman and never show up in a church, never show up in a, a temple, you go to a courthouse and you get married, that gets recognized as marriage. And you do not have to have any particular faith, you do not have to have any faith at all to do that. So the idea that marriage, the word marriage, is somehow exclusively the province of particular religious institutions, I think is just demonstrably false. Beyond that, I would point, let me finish. Beyond that, I would point out that there are a number of religious traditions that do bless same-sex unions and do consider them marriages. So if we really want to talk about religious freedom, why are we as a state giving preference to some interp religious interpretations of what marriage should be over what other religious interpretations of what marriage should be? Then the state gets involved in saying which religion is correct, and of course we don't want the state to do that. Don't you think that's a bit of a stretch to just assume that the state is giving preference to a certain religious uh, aspect? Well, you're the one who said that it's necessarily religious, so now I want to know which religion. No, no, he's saying that you, could, you, you can't ask him to exclude his religious sensibility from the question of what is marriage. Well, well that, that's, that's different. Exactly. That's that, 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 okay, so I misunderstood your question. If that's your question, I would say, that's fine in terms of what you personally pursue religiously as marriage. My religious sensibility may say that interfaith marriage is not acceptable. So then I shouldn't have an interfaith marriage, but the state shouldn't prohibit me from doing that just because that's some other people's religious, religious sensibility. So, 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 so I'll be married. I keep going. Um, uh, I think we'll just we'll move over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything not because I don't have anything to say, but because it was directed to John. So a point of consensus between you two, if I'm understanding correctly, is that you do both see value in a secular government in supporting the upbringing of healthy citizens that can be productive members of society and psychologically stable. Sure. Um, and then the conversation becomes... That's Socrates. Who could deny it's Socrates? Right. <laughs> and then advocating for traditional marriage, and then you're here advocating with that as an accepted thing, but unrelated to your argument, that gay marriage ought to be legal in your eyes. Um, so, Dr. Gravino, I'm interested to know what policy change or cultural change do you feel would best serve the end of ensuring that our civil society has productive, untraumatized, un healthy adults? What policy change, you mean beyond same-sex marriage? I, is that the policy, do you believe that, that same-sex? I am advocating for allowing same-sex couples to marry uh, un under the existing legal structure of marriage, uh, I'm advocating for same-sex couples to be allowed to do that. But, but, but can, 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 I, can I, I think, like, just like I'm asked often, well, okay, if not marriage, what would you do for gay people, right? And so is, are you asking what, in addition to gay marriage, he thinks is important? No, I, I, yes, I, I'm asking... Universal what health care? What? I mean... <laughs> 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 I mean we We only have so much time. I, 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 mean, I don't want to dismiss your question, but I'm just not sure where we're well, My point is simply that you can accept from her that she's advocating for uh, raising healthy kids. Yes. And in order to then continue to pursue your argument that gay marriage should be legal, that you can also say, here's how we can best raise healthy kids. And right. you don't have to touch my marriage. Right. Well, what I, what I would want to say is that really, I, I'm concerned about many of the same things that Maggie is concerned about. Uh, you know, particularly having to do with children in suboptimal situations, children experiencing abandonment, fatherlessness, and so on. But I think that in order to work on that, we need to work on things like poverty, we need to work on things like educational access. We need to work on you know, joining forces to build a healthy marriage culture, uh, but not on fighting same-sex marriage. Okay, over here. I have a two-part question directed towards Maggie. Um, first of all, in regards to heterosexual couples who marry but do not plan on having kids, do you feel that they undermine the central role of marriage as raising families? And also, 
do you think your efforts would be better put towards uh, restricting adoption by homosexual couples and just creating the social norm of child rearing as father mother situation? Um, so I think that if you get married, if you're a man, but let's, let's, this actually applies more to men than to women, so let me just focus on that. I think if you get married and you say, ah, oh, I don't want kids, that's one thing. But if you got married and then secretly said, I have a right to divorce my wife if she got pregnant because that wasn't part of the deal, I would say you're not really married. So it would be one thing to say, well, my ideal is to not have children. It would be where I kind of draw the line is even if the law thought you were married, even if you went around and represented yourselves as married, if you thought you had a right not to have children, and that it would be a violation of the terms of your marriage, such that you would be morally justified to leave your wife if she got pregnant. I would say that's not a marriage. So you want to change legal marriage, too? No, I'm not changing. I don't think anyone's doing that legally. Let's, let's just hear that. Well, I actually do. I do think unilateral no fault divorce is a problem. He asked two questions. Well, so does, before it, does, it, does it matter to you whether it, the child that your wife is pregnant with is your child? That is, if your wife sort of went to somebody else to get pregnant, yes. would that make a difference? Okay. Yeah. I also don't think you have a right to have a child with someone other than your sure. spouse. So those are reflective. Okay. Okay, no, wait, he asked a second part. Right. <laughs> okay. So the second question, I see adoption as fulfilling a totally different function in society. Adoption is not about the ideal, even though it's a very good thing. Adoption is, what do we do? we got children who don't even have one parent willing to take care of them. And so the state's obligation, I actually think the state should prefer married mothers and fathers to children. Because that's what was taken away. Every child starts with a mom and a dad, biologically. And then if you can replace that, that's great. But babies don't sit around waiting. I mean, we can't, we can't wait for the, the preferable ideal. And we should be grateful for every responsible person who's willing to raise a child. And that's the way I understand adoption. So that's why I don't think, I don't see how banning gay adoption would protect child well-being, whereas idealizing the mother-father family does. Okay, so over here. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you took most of my question. But, um, so ask John something. <laughs> well, my question then to you, Ms. Gallagher, sorry, is, um, so, from what I understand, you are for um, homosexuals having uh, and adopting children, but you are against homosexuals who marry even if they choose not to have children afterwards because it undermines I don't raising think it's a marriage. Children. I don't think two men are a marriage. It's not like I'm against their marrying. I don't think it's a marriage. And I think protecting that understanding of marriage is related to protecting children. And I think there's something really weird about the state saying that I'm good enough to adopt several children, but not good enough to have legal Listen, marriage. I realize you don't think it's what I'm having is real marriage, but having legal marriage with my partner. That's a strike me as very strange. So then it's important to preserve the ideals of raising children, but not important, as John stated, to legally support. I guess what I'm trying to say is it's okay to adopt children and um, take care of them and raise them, but you're against getting rid of the, like, obtruding upon the ideals. I don't think that gay marriage is related to child well-being in an impor any important way. <laughs> Most likely. Now, that's an, in some ways an empirical question that you could potentially answer. But, uh, you know, there's this weird stuff. You go to the social science literature, there's a lot of weird stuff in it that doesn't... <laughs> Bit. So, Gottrell and Moss have an ongoing lesbian mothering study. It's been published in Pediatrics. It's part of the whole No Difference literature. It's one of the largest and one of the longest running. It's not nationally, it's not based on a probability sample. And they found that it doesn't matter whether lesbian parents break up for child well-being. It's totally against like the emerging consensus that what matters is stability. I don't know what I 
think about this study, it's inconsistent with a lot of other kind of research on other family forms. It may just represent lesbian mothers saying optimistic things. It could be the basis of lesbian motherhood is totally different. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. All I know is it's sitting there in the literature. By the way, it found that children being bullied had no effect on their well-being too. So I suspect it means the lesbian mothers in this study are really determined to be optimistic about how well their children are doing. But I don't know. In that particular study, I think the, uh, the uh, mothers, even when they broke apart, uh, yeah. they actually stayed connected to their children. And that's part of the explanation why the children seem to do pretty well. Well, no, it may, the study actually says it doesn't matter whether lesbian mothers. So it could be that for lesbian mothers, the partnership is not that important. I don't know. My question is another one for Ms. Gallagher. Um, as I understand it, your main argument against the civil marriage of same-sex same couples is that um, the marriage of couples, or the recognition of marriages of couples who cannot biologically produce children together will diminish the respect for um, marriage as in terms of the raising of children especially biological children. Um, I was wondering if you could go more into how um, or why the marriage of heterosexual couples who are known beforehand to be fully infertile. For example, in the case that a woman has had an orchidectomy and is completely incapable, incapable of producing eggs. Um, why that does not draw away from marriage in terms of the, why that does not draw away from the ideas of marriage. There's something really artificial about raising these, I mean, maybe not for a philosopher, but <laughs> something very artificial about it. I, I will repeat what I said. Before we were trying to come up with an argument for marriage equality understood as including why same-sex couples are just as married as anyone else. Nobody ever raised these examples. They were not, they're not really, it's kind of like saying, well, the reason we have an equal right to gay marriage is because of gender equality. Um, nobody ever thought that by requiring a man to marry a woman before we were, you know, I mean, there's something artificial about it in the sense that um, nobody ever raised that argument before they were raising what they really cared about, which is sexual orientation. <coughs> so let me pause and ask you. You're a gay, you, you believe in gay marriage, I assume. Can you believe in gay marriage and also believe that the ideal for a child is a married mom and a dad. Can you endorse both of those ideas? Um, <clears throat> well, I believe that the um, optimal situation, the completely best situation is possible that it, that would be um, between a mom and a dad. Okay, um, that's good. So you can, I don't think you can. that contradicts, but since we live in the real world, not the ideal world. <laughs> <laughs> can I say something really quick? Yeah, the, the, the infertile couples issue was not raised before because we never told them that they were not allowed to marry. It's like, it's not that elderly people came to the courthouse door or the church door and we said, go away, what are you, you're not gonna have kids, get out of here. Uh, be, because we recognize that marriage had these other important purposes having to do with adult sharing of life and mutual care and commitment and so on. That's, so so actually, I think that Maggie suggests actually, this is artificial. Actually, I'm pointing out an inconsistency. Actually, well, the way, the, what the law did, the, the law did two things. It said, if you're able to engage in sexual interest, Classically, if you're able to engage in sexual intercourse, you can get married. Uh, if you're unwilling to have children, your marriage can be annulled. What actually happened is that with the advent of unilateral divorce, the law of annulment ceased to matter anymore because everyone's marriage can be annulled. 
by a, when the, we just call it a unilateral divorce, right? But it's interesting. So what the law, classic, the classic understanding of marriage was that if you can engage in a sexual relationship between a man and a woman, you can get married. But if you're unwilling to have children, that's not really a marriage. If you can't have children, that's one thing. If you're unwilling to have children, that's something else. And these things got kind of stopped being important legally because we decided we could annul any marriage at any time for any reason. And so the law of annulment ceased to be important. Which suggests that our understanding of marriage has changed in a very dramatic way, and yet we're holding same-sex couples to a very different idea. Except that when we when we went to unilateral divorce, we said, oh, we're not changing our end. I mean, one of the reasons I got involved in the gay marriage today is I was 11 when the unilateral divorce, I, I had no responsibility for it, right? I couldn't stop it. But at the time, what happened is Aline said, oh, this isn't going to change our understanding of marriage. We're just going to let a small number of people out of marriage, and the whole public understanding of marriage will go on. And I, I think that's not true. I think the law's understanding of marriage is powerful. I, I would agree with you there. I'm a student from here, and I support gay marriage and straight marriage. And I have a question. Um, <laughs> does this come from um, Ms. Gallagher's um, argument on child rearing? And what I what what I hear is that it is detrimental for a child to be brought up without a mother or father because uh, it will lead to absence of motherhood and fatherhood. Do you see that it is impossible for a same-sex couple? to have both the role of motherhood and fatherhood because it seems like you're telling me that motherhood and fatherhood is defined by biological sex. Yeah, I think a child who's raised by two men does not have a relationship with his, his or her mother. I think that that's pretty clear. Now, that doesn't mean that... So, how do children fare raised by these two guys? The answer is, I don't know. I suspect compared to the society, you know, the society we live in, the child, I mean, I'm not, these are not the children I'm primarily worried about, um, but I don't know. I mean, I can't endorse it. I don't know how those children do. Um, but I do think they're missing something important, which is a mother. If those two men adopted a child, it's not their fault. They don't have a mother. If they decide to you know, hire a womb and put together eggs, then they're deliberately choosing for their child not to have a mother, and that's a kind of different uh, situation. Um, the, one of the reasons I don't, I'm not against gay marriage, I mean, it's really expensive to buy wombs and put together, I mean, it's a tiny, tiny number of child that each of those children matter. But what, I, the, what I'm really concerned about with same-sex marriage is that we're taking an institution that has, or at least had, as its main, one of its major purposes, bringing mothers together for children, and we're repurposing it to be about something else. And now we don't have any social institution that's about this idea. And that's what is problematic. This is just, this might sound weird, but I don't think I've ever heard any feminist, despite insisting on equal rights for both genders, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone ask that a wife be called a husband, or that a sister be called a brother, or that we just do away with the words and call everyone siblings and spouses. So... You have to go to Sweden. I think it's getting different. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but theoretically, if it were possible to have an institution of civil unions and have every right be equal and be regarded as equal um, in practice, would that be acceptable? Um, I guess this is a question for both. Well, if you're saying would be regarded as equal in practice so that it doesn't have the different effects that in the real world we found that it has, then what, we would be, what we, you'd be saying is we would have marriage and 
but we would just be calling it something different. It's not even like giving half a loaf instead of giving the full loaf. It's like the full loaf, but we're not going to call it bread. Um, and I just think that that's weird, right? I mean, it's like, it, it, it's just just weird. Uh, but if it really were treated different, treated the same in practice, then I don't see that there would be a problem. The reason there has been a problem is because our experience is that it's not treated the same in practice. In my very first book, uh, Enemies of Eros, How the Sexual Re Revolution is Killing Family, Marriage, and Book, it, uh, Family, Marriage, and Sex, and What We Can Do About It, uh, which I wrote when I was 28, is a critique of orthodox feminism. Um, so I don't know that I can, I mean, I don't know that I can speak for uh, feminists. Um, the larger case I'm making is, uh, which is, of which the gay marriage critique is, is only a small part, is uh, I actually don't think we can get along without civilized norms of <laughs> masculinity or without attaching meaning to our bodies, male or female. I think people are very hungry for some way to attach meaning to the body, and both men and women. But I also think that when it's more important for men than for women, that both men and women are hurt in a society that doesn't cultivate norms of masculinity and femininity, um, but particularly masculinity. Hannah Rosen just wrote a very interesting book called The End of Men, which I think has a lot of, sort of errors of social science in it. Uh, but the larger point she's making is really, it, I think, I can't speak for her either, is that in a society that has gender neutral status <coughs> cues, um, women seem to be responding to them a lot more intently than men. And the simple way of putting that is that if we've given up on the idea of trying to raise men to be not gender neutral people, good people, but good men, um, there's a whole bunch of guys that decide that the amount of effort it takes um, to acquire, you know, to pay for beer, video games, and internet porn, that's kind of good enough for them. Right? I, I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem if we do not care about creating good men. It's a problem for men, it's a bigger problem for women, and it's a really big problem for children. I don't know that John would disagree with me. I agree with that's a big problem for children, but I still think you have a really dismal view of men. <laughs> <laughs> why this, uh, this the YouTube thing is going on the Gender Studies website, and it's obviously relevant to gender roles, and it's in what Gender Studies does, so you can take another look for it at that, and it's there. Gender is not just roles, that's the point I want to make, but also. Well, we'll be outside to talk to people more, right? When we yes, right and, and you don't have to buy a book to come talk to us, you have to <laughs> sign books if you buy them. Um, I have a website, johncorbino.com. On YouTube, I've got some short videos. Maggie if, you, if you want to get a newsletter from me every week, you can go to culturewarvictoryfund.org. I'd love, love to talk to you every week. Well, let's keep the discussion going then. Thank you. Thank you all.